Welcome everybody to VCFM 15's virtual presentation. To do with what everything that's going on with the COVID and all that, we couldn't be together in person. I hope everybody's safe. My presentation today is going to be on the hardware created none other by, than by Jim Drew. As we know, in the Commodore, software protection was a big thing. It was also on the Apple, some on the IBM, but the Commodore world, there's just tons of programs. And um, you had everything that we all use, Fast Hackem, uh, Copy2, Dissector, Ultrabyte, Maverick, Renegade. Um, and then there was also the uh, Supercard Utilities. Well, those utilities were great. And I call them utilities because they were the tools that we used to copy the various forms of copy protection that was applied to the disks when we wanted to make a, an archival copy for ourselves, a backup, so we could play that instead of the original. Well, over time, a lot of this protection got very sophisticated, and the disk drives needed 8K of additional RAM so that the, the copiers routines could address that additional RAM to copy the new forms of protection. These 8K RAM boards came out and they were essentially just a simple board and they had a set of leads on them and these leads were where you put you attached to various chips on your drive and then you would take one of the process the processing chip out of your disk drive you would unpry that and you plug this into that there's a set of pins on the back that you depress into the into that socket and then you put your your uh, your, your additional processing chip on here. Then these leads were attached to the various points on other chips so that it would function. Now, Jim came up with various other, uh, other, other 8K boards when they came out. Some of them had as simple as a rib cable would come out and you'd plug this into the chip spot because of uh, the board's layout the drive, depending on which drive you chose, uh, there's 41s, 412s, 1571s, and then you would put your processing chip in here. In the August ad of Run in 1985, they talked about a board I'd call the Shadow. Now they said the, the, the Shadow is a new and revolutionary piece of hardware that is used to duplicate even the most protected software. Fitting inside the disk drive, so you won't have any soldering required, Shadow takes complete control of all functions, giving you near 100% of all the copies. And they claimed it was the best utility available. It will even copy the other copy programs. Because of the Shadow's unique abilities, we feel DOS protection is a thing of the past. And they were stating too that by the time you get your board, they will have developed every routine to copy the programs of the time. So I plucked down my almost $100, $89.95 for it, and I waited. Well then about three months later, in the run ad of November 85, they introduced the Hacker's Package. Now the Hacker's Package, it's a shadow disk. This will shadow a disk while it loads and then read an exact list of the track sector, ID, checksum, drive status, also the high and low track limits, density use of each track, half tracks that are used, command, they also have a command recorder that shows where the commands were sent to the 1541 while program was loading. There was a RAM recorder that records custom DOS. Then in that unique program was a thing called shadow scan would do any disk, then read its exact list of valid tracks, half tracks, partial tracks, and segments, sync marks, head block links, and data block links, track to set track synchronization, an exclusive snapshot recorder will give you an exact copy of 1541 RAM and can be viewed, saved, or printed, and then it even had more features than that. I was all excited. Well, and on top of that, there was an add-on display called the GT Package. It was $44.95, a highly sophisticated and integrated piece of hardware that turns your 1541 into something you've always wanted. A track and sector display, drive reset switch, 
you had a drive number change, half track indicator, abnormal bit density indicator, and then there was a shadow light on there to tell you when it was running. The shadow display, will, it says, will give you an accurate display of precisely what track you're accessing during a normal load, even if the program does not read past track 35. But you need the shadow board with that. So I added it up. Hacker's package was $39.95, and the GT package was $44.95. I sent my additional funds in for the, to order the complete package. I felt that this is how it was going to be. I'll be able to copy everything from where the time I bought it until the future. Now, they sent us our boards. We got them a while later with a letter explaining that um, we have two options. We could keep the board or return it for our money back. If, and then they, they also said if we wanted to keep the board, they would give us $90 in credit on Megasoft purchases with the promise of an operational version as soon as it's available. The board never got fit, never got upgraded. That was it. Now, the shadow was designed by a Portland engineer by the name of Jack Cornelius. Now, he built the board to fit into our 1541 drives so that he could back up protected software. Now, he was a great engineer. He even attended several Portland user groups to show off the shadow board even before it was released. One of the things about the board was it was never designed to work or intended to work. I think personally that he was a great engineer that was way ahead of his time, but he was not a software engineer writer. He collaborated with a lot of people to help build, to get the board to work. And had he developed the software, it could have been a great program. Well, he wanted too much, he asked too much to do at the time. Technology wasn't ready for this. He hired Jim Drew to work for him at Megasoft to get the shadow to work. Well, Jim was already developing his own board, and that was called the Echo Board. It was an 8K RAM board. He used some of the design of that from Echo. He said, my fix for the shadow board did convert onboard memory to just 8K of usable RAM. Then I used the Echo software for it. At that point, the shadow board was actually useful. Because of the layered design of this board, he didn't have, he had no idea how to get it, how it worked. And he said a lot of the a common thing back then was removing of the, the chip IDs and that were off of it. So nobody could really trace well, then in about April of 87, Jim released his original Echo Board to the public with software, and he sold it under, the under a company's name of Underwear, which was his company. And he sold that for about six months. Then he was employed by Utilities Unlimited, where he then took his original Echo Board and created the SuperCard which was introduced in December of 87. It was simply an 8K RAM expansion. So a drive could read a whole track into SRAM. Then your program with that had the necessary copy code to address that additional RAM. That's a lot of functions built into the everything from the GCR nibbler to a whole track copier to a clone program. You would always use the GCR nibbler to try to copy everything. And most of the time, it would give you a working copy. Nothing else had to be done. If not, then you would have to go in and use the various scanners. Then you would take all of those various readings from the disk scanner, and you would put those into the parameter menu. And that's where you go into your options, is where you can start your start ending track, your gap filler byte, track filler length, format mode, adjustment syncs, number of copies, and you can change your various density levels. And then you could create a uh, working copy. Jim also supplied, um, every time you got an update, or if you called him, he would send you a sheet 
with all the known veritables to copy programs, like he would put all the Summer Games or the Pocket Writer series. Or if there was VMAX or Rapid Lock, he wrote that in there, and then uh, that's the way you could, you could use these veritables to copy most of the software at the time. With the initial success of the Supercard, within about a year they sold about 5,000 uh, boards. Software Support came out with their own board called the RAM board. Now basically it was the same board as the Supercard. The RAM board basically required pre-made copiers. Um, basically just a parameter versus an open copier that could be uh, ch uh, its parameters could be defined to copy whatever program you wanted to con to. The other thing is this the, the RAM board software could be used with the Supercard so uh, board too. These parameter disks were best for the people that didn't know what they were doing. It, it was simplified but it limited you to only those specific parameters. Now they did have a RAM board nibbler if you go into the menu, you'll see Fast Copiers, GCR Nibbler. You go into Select GCR Nibbler. You can go Single, Dual, or RAM Board Nibbler. It has Copy Disk, Source, and your target device, Starting Track, and Ending Track, Read Accuracy, read How Many Times You Want to Write the Retries, Target Speed, and that was just about it. So it was a very basic cop Nibbler copier. So you could play with it and see if it would copy Now, we're looking at one of the parameters on for the RAM board, and if you, if you scroll through all the parameter menu, you'll find that it says custom copier, use a 154171 with 8K of RAM only. We select it. Now, this copier is very basic. It's just copy side one, target, source device, target device, check the drive speed, or software drives. Verify RAM, drive RAM, verify off, and RAM. That's about all you have for, for a custom copier. It's very pretty much written just for that title. Overall, it did a decent job of copying with its parameters and nibbler. I mean, Maverick was a great copy program, so it was another good set of tools. Whereas the Supercard could copy literally everything, Jim needed to find a way to examine the disk as it was loading so he could develop the parameters for the Supercard. To do this, he developed a product called the Super Tracker, which was created by Jim Drew and Wes Weiss. It was April of 89. I bought mine shortly after that for about 70 bucks. Now this version had an LED display for the track, including half track, and an LED for density, along with a right protect bypass switch, drive reset switch, and a drive 8-9 selector switch. This unit required direct soldering to the disk drive. I didn't like that version. I wanted it to be more portable. So I went and got an RS-232 cable, and luckily uh, somebody I knew could solder, and they helped me. We soldered all those little leads from the places along the board, because you had to put in numerous leads of wire and we put it into a little RS-232 male and female junction on the side of my drive. And that allowed me to move the drive around, A, for demos and for copying. Made it more convenient. And I put that in the original Supercard uh, 1541C drive. When I talked to Jim on the phone, he always told me that, um, you know, the way, one of the things he said, well, for the, programs would load so fast, he would put a VHS camera right focused on that display and he would then turn around after he loaded the program and he would slow it down so he could see how the program loaded. The, the, the super tracker to help him develop all the parameters for the, the SuperCard and the SuperCard Plus software. The, the super tracker was very important to that to the latter half of that time. Software protection got so sophisticated, Jim needed to, to improve on the Supercard. So in the summer of 89, he introduced the Supercard Plus. Now the Supercard Plus maps its 8K RAM on the 1541 in memory location S6000. The RAM board was at S8000. Now the Supercard also had a set of ROMs on board 
which had extra routines in it. Most of the most of it was for the copiers and the tools on the SuperCard software used these routines. And it also had an identify card. There was a small ROM that he had placed on there in the 8KS RAM on the SuperCard. This included the collection of best helper code, so copy programs didn't have to upload into the drive much faster, smaller program. And yes, the, the SuperCard Plus board did work with Maverick software. The first thing you see is copiers or utilities. On the last version, this was in 91, when he made his last set of utilities for this. If you hit one, there's all your copiers. So you have a GCR nibbler, a fast nibbler, a whole track nibbler, track cloner, which exactly what it says, a data copier, which is basically a fast copier, a parallel copier, which worked with the SuperCard Plus, a parallel cable, a turbo nibbler, parameters, which were an AI copier and a GCR nibbler. And under the, uh, under the parameters, when you selected it, you could go to older, new, older VMAX, older EA, or newer VMAX. It goes through, you have to make a copy of the disk with the data copper before using this program, and then you would, Jim's parameter would run on it from there. Utilities are sector editor, error scanner, fast format, disk scanner, change device, you could do a disk file log, log on all, unscratch, directory sort, alter the header, and of course the speed check. So without these improvements, we couldn't copy a lot of the software we have, up until the demise of the Commodore itself. The Super Tracker 2 is the second generation display for the Commodore and most cloned disk drives. Now, almost 30 years later, <laughs> to the original release date, and a lot of us Commodore users asking Jim for a new display, he created the Super Tracker 2. Now, the Super Tracker 2 was released around April of 2018. It uses an OLED screen instead of LEDs, shows the, the motor state, the write protect status, track, including half tracks, density, and number of sinks on a track. The Super Tracker 2 also offers the ability to record and play back up to 1,500 changes on the track, density, and number of sinks. Unlike the original Super Tracker, the Super Tracker 2 is a simple plug-in board that sits between a VIA chip and the disk drive's motherboard. Which makes the installation fairly straightforward. Jim Drew developed the SuperCard Pro in the spring of 2014. The main reason he developed it was for data recovery. Well, little did he know that it would become a major player in the uh, format conversions from analog to digital. It's a USB-driven device, or it can be uh, it can be standalone, driven by one of its two serial ports. Now, currently, only PC driver software is available. Now, the, the software for the SuperCard will always be a work in progress as it's updated uh, for different formats to support. Everything from the Amstrad to the TSR-80 to the Commodores, which it was mainly developed for. You can make a backup of any physical 5 and a quarter or 3 and a half inch drive of any format using one of the two drives. You can create a digital file of it for the 64, we can go G64 files. I hope you enjoyed my presentation on what Jim Drew created for us over the years. I hope everybody's safe, and we'll see everybody next year at VCFM 16, hopefully not virtual. Have a great year, and check out my face, uh, YouTube channel. I'll be pre presenting a lot more stuff on copy protection and that. Enjoy the following images of devices people have created for the Commodore over the years.